Wow. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Does that look like a good... I got everything in frame. Yes. Well, hey to those of you guys who are hanging out with me. Um, let me know if my uh, sound quality is okay. I'm just kind of talking uh, right, <laughs> right to my phone, so hopefully that's okay. Um, yesterday, we had our first day of Arttober flowers, and here are the, uh, the two drawings I did. I just did like a pen drawing over here, and then I did a classic watercolor. So yesterday was poppies, and I, uh, I wrote out all the prompts on this first page. I actually really hate how this turned out. <laughs> I was going to post it like on social media, and I was like, hmm, I'll keep this for me. <laughs> so you guys are privy to that. But anyways, so today we're going to be doing dahlias, and I love dahlias. They're super geometric, and yeah, they're just a lot of fun, a lot of petals. But I actually think that they're a little bit easier than other, like I think that roses and uh, peonies are a lot harder than dahlias, even though dahlias look like they're kind of complex like roses or peonies. So, okay, you can see my palette and everything here. I'm going to be using Alizarin Crimson. I'm using like the Winsor & Newton Professional Series Alizarin Crimson. And then I'm, you can tell that on this palette I've got like a million different green colors, but I'll probably mostly use this one called Perilene, which I really love, Perilene Green. And then I also always use a lot of sap green, which I believe is that one. <laughs> but I keep just like squirting these tiny little dots and I don't even know what they are. So I kind of always just end up being like, eh, and just mix a bunch of colors and see what looks good. Um, I'm very uh, laid back about my, my paint colors. But besides that, I'm using a Derwent Graphic F Pencil for my sketch because F Pencils are the best for erasing after you'd finished painting. Oh my gosh, yesterday I did the F Pencil in this sketchbook. Um, by the way, this sketchbook is um, from a girl named Ka Ka Kaya, I think that's how you pronounce her name, and her brand is called Dustling and Heart. But yesterday I sketched this poppy with my F pencil. And then after I erased, I literally could not even see the faintest pencil marks, which is actually super, super rare. And so this paper here is mixed media. It's not classic watercolor paper. And I wonder if just the smooth surface of mixed media makes it so much better for erasing. I'm not positive about that, but just a theory I have. <laughs> so F pencil. I'm going to go ahead and sketch out my, um, my composition here. If you guys want to draw or paint along with me, I added a couple of um, the, the images that I'm using as references in the description. They're both from Upsplash, so I have those over here on my computer so I can see, and I'm just going to start sketching. So for my Dahlia, I always start in the center of a flower and then work my way out. And so I'll just kind of get that rough center shape. And I kind of just start drawing these little petals that are folding in towards the very, very center. It's going to end up just looking really kind of tight and busy. So I don't worry about having the detail super perfect because I think that a lot of times with watercolor, even detailed watercolors, I think it's more about the impression of detail than it is like actually getting all the teeny teeny little details. Um, but we'll probably talk about that more as we go. So it kind of looks like it's like all these little teeth <laughs> that are going in towards that center, okay? Bunch of little triangle shapes. And and then they start getting a little bit more 
round as we start getting a little bit further away from that center, really tight area. Thank you guys for those comments. I can see them. I'll try and keep an eye over there. If you have questions, just pop them in and I'll, I'll look over it from time to time, okay? This is definitely the part where I really try to take my time and not rush it because a good sketch leads to a good painting. Um, for me, it's like, if I don't do a sketch first, I pretty much guarantee I'm not really gonna like the end result very much. But that's just me, like I just, I don't know, it really helps me when I have a really nice plan. Okay. <laughs> I feel like I'm getting distracted by talking. Okay, so I'm gonna start making some of these reach out just a bit further. And this dolly I'm drawing is not one of the classic, just little circular dahlias. I'm doing one that's just a bit more, um, the petals are a little bit more ruffly, ruffled. So they're not all gonna be really consistent looking like a classic dahlia where all the petals are very uniform. So I want some of these petals to be kind of turning away. I'm making it look a little too consistent right now, so I'm gonna try and make them a little more wavy. Um, Jessica, I am not really sure, but if I had to guess, I would say an hour. <laughs> just until I, until I get this where I like it. I, I find that if I'm just doing one paint subject, I think an hour is, is usually pretty realistic. But if I'm doing a bunch of flowers, usually, yeah, an hour of flower. <laughs> that seems to be about right. Man, I felt yesterday, um, to those who are following along with our Arttober flowers, um, you know, our October painting or drawing challenge. I am not used to sharing art that people are expecting me to share, if that makes sense. So to be honest, I'm just telling you guys, I felt really intimidated to share um, my prompt yesterday because I saw about a hundred other ones come in that were so cool, so interesting. And I guess I didn't realize how many people were going to be participating. And I was like, dang it, now I'm intimidated. <laughs> so it's been so much fun though. I've loved seeing all of the art roll in. Art from all over the world, actually. It's been amazing. I love how all the people in Australia, they share their, uh, their work so much earlier because they're so far ahead of us. This Dahlia made it a little bit off-center, which I don't usually do that. So I think the way I'm going to counter that as I'm composing is I'm going to make a, like a probably a giant leaf or a larger leaf coming out this way. That way it feels balanced as a composition because right now this feels kind of wonky. Um, yesterday's was very centered. But there's always ways to work around that. There's always ways to make even asymmetrical paintings feel balanced. I'm actually working right now on the curriculum for a, a class all about how to compose florals. And I'm just gonna talk about everything I can possibly think about in regards to a good floral composition. And so I've been planning it out the last couple of weeks. And as I've been preparing, I've just realized like how much there really is to it. Um, and how deep of a dive you really can go into composition. So that's where my brain's at lately, just thinking about composition so much.
So I'll probably talk about some stuff that I've been learning while I'm working on this one. Okay, maybe a few more petals coming off in a few different directions. I'm not sure what these types of dahlias are called. I'm sure there's different variety names, but this is just one of those really kind of ruffled looking ones that isn't super, super circular like I mentioned. There's a lot of varieties of dahlias. Some of them have like um, just very, very few petals and then some of them have tons. It just kind of depends on what hybrid or whatever it is. Okay. And then at the very back, I'm just going to draw a couple of little teeny like wispy guys. And I feel like that I don't know, it just gives it a little more interest, in my opinion. It doesn't feel too structured. It feels kind of organic and kind of wild. Um, okay, so now I'm going to draw, as I mentioned, the leaves and stem. So let's see here. When I'm drawing long lines like this, I always do really feathery lines at first, just because I'm always scared to commit. <laughs> I do want this to be rounding just a bit more. There we go. Now I'm going to draw a large leaf back here. Dahlia leaves are serrated. So the edges of the leaves are not smooth. They feel kind of kind of ruffly. Let's see. Thanks, Sandra. I thought I thought about doing Patreon, and I don't know if I have it in me. <laughs> I uh, I have a lot of friends who use Patreon, and it works amazing for them. But um, I think my only issue with it is I, I I like to very spontaneously create, and I a lot of the people who use Patreon, I think that you can kind of become kind of a little bit of like a, I don't know, it becomes like a boss situation because you do have to deliver every month on whatever promises or expectations you've, um, um, you know, created for your patrons. So I think that I don't think I would thrive if I was doing that. I think that it would start to make, maybe feel like it was, I was creating out of obligation and not out of like just pure joy. <laughs> so may, I don't know, maybe we'll see. There is something pretty cool about that idea of like a membership. Mm. Kind of struggling with my leaves. I'm trying to think how I want to do it. I think I'm going to draw a leaf actually just kind of right uh, going across that stem. So it kind of looks like it's coming towards me. I don't know how well you can see this sketch in the video. I hope you can see it. F pencils are super light. Um, so sometimes it's hard to see. Whenever I teach my classes through Michaels, I typically will just use classic like number two click pencil because it's just like twice as dark as this. So all right, actually that feels that feels good. I actually like that. I think it gives it a little more interest instead of just coming off to the right and left. I mean, that's how leaves look in reality, right? They're usually just kind of going every direction. So, um, 
give you one more. And I intentionally did not go over this before because I wanted it to feel a little bit more in the moment and organic. And to be honest, I do want this um, challenge we're doing. I, I don't want it to be like, I don't want my art to always be super perfect and curated um, because that's not reality. And to be honest, I don't always like the work I create, but I want to be... Um, I don't know, just be real <laughs> and share that it's not always perfect and, um, yeah, that's okay. It's about being bold, it's about just creating, it's about enjoying the process. It's not about creating perfect art that you would want in a gallery every time, you know. Yeah, I, I create a lot of duds, <laughs> but having the sketch really helps me. So some of you guys might be like, can you get the painting? I'll get there, I promise. But sketch is very important. And I'm also starting to really fall in love with the process of sketching. I just got a big old sketchbook that I just fill with um, botanical drawings and it's become my new favorite hobby. Um, every, every, um, Pretty much every night my husband and I will put on a show and I'll just go grab my sketchbook and just fill it with um, my botanical drawings while we watch our show. And also we've been on like such a like kid show kick. Um, we started watching Avatar with The Last Airbender and then we watched Legend of Korra and then we couldn't like bring ourselves to watch anything that just felt heavy. We just were really enjoying like the wholesome kid shows. <laughs> so we started watching this show called Troll Hunters on Netflix. And it's just about this boy who becomes, it's a lot like Avatar. He like becomes like the, the troll protector and you know, it's just, it's silly and it's fun. And <laughs> I feel like I just need it. This year it's got so much heavy vibes and kid shows, man. That's where it's at. Kid shows, kids movies. Good for the soul. Okay, so I am liking the sketch. I'll hold it up for you just because I want to make sure you can see it fairly well. So there, there's the sketch. Um, now I'm going to mix some colors. I will, I'm using this is, let's see here, this is the Series 7. I have a size 3 and a size round brush. And if you can see it, it's hard to tell. <laughs> but these are both uh, Sable brushes. And so I believe Sable is actually squirrel hair. And so I only have a few of these, but they're very special to me. I've had them for a long, long time. But they hold a ton of water and they still have a very nice point and they just last very long. So I'm gonna get a mixture of, actually, you know what I'll do? I'll do the, I'll do the flower first. So this is over here. I have some alizarin crimson. So I'll get a mixture going here. I'll take a quick, quick sip of my tea. Okay, so that mixture is good to go. I will grab a little bit of Aureole and Yellow. And I'm going to drop that Aureole and Yellow, which is just like a very cool green. You can use Lemon Yellow. Um, you can probably use, honestly, use any yellow you have. Windsor Yellow, Cadmium Yellow. But I'm just gonna drop just a tiny bit in that center because that's what I'm seeing in the reference. <laughs> A lot of times the center of flowers do have a more yellow tint to them. Even if it's really subtle, uh, getting that detail in there is just going to create for a more interesting, true to life um, uh, painting. I always try and get all of those colors I see. Rarely when you just see a pink flower is it just pink. 
If you really take the time to look, you'll see that there's probably some blue and purple and yellow, um, white. There's a lot of colors besides pink, at least in my reference that I'm looking at right now. So I'm going to, I will go ahead and I'm going to start on the outer edges and just start very lightly dropping my pink mixture. Uh, this does not have a lot of pigment. I, this is a very watery, watery brush I'm using. And it's going to dry even lighter because that is how watercolor works. It dries lighter than uh, it is when you lay it down on the paper. But we learn to work with it. So just always plan that it'll be a little bit lighter. You can always come back and add some darker color values, which I definitely always do. So since that center area is still drying a bit um, with that yellow I dropped, I'm going to go ahead and let all of this area dry. Um, I'm not able to add detail to my paintings if I layer wet paint on wet paint because basically the water will just take it and expand it and um, you're not able to actually add any detail while stuff is still wet. So I have to work in layers. That's how. How I create my paintings. So I'm grabbing some sap green and a little bit of perylene, which is kind of making it a little bit cooler. It's just slightly more desaturated. And I'm going to, real quick, I'm just going to get this little clip there. Draw my stem. And I'm just going to do, I call this my underwash. So I do one layer where it's just pretty much even color throughout the painting. Oh, I just saw that there's a bunch more comments. I'm going to delete that right away. I have them in my yard file. Okay. Um, also, just uh, <laughs> just to just so you know, like I had to just refresh my screen because it the stream kind of stopped. So. That was an issue for you. You probably already figured it out if you're hearing this. <laughs> also, I love this color green so much. It's not a super popular um, color. I don't think a lot of people have it in their palettes, but even if I don't have it in a palette I'm using, I'll still mix colors to kind of get it by mixing some green with blue. And I'm still able to kind of achieve that color but it's just nice to have it already good to go. Very, very cool, but also not too blue. Like it still feels like warm, but on the cool side, I don't know how that works, but, but it does. It's warm and cool. <laughs> it's just so balanced and so pretty. It's like a nice forest green, I guess. So I will let that part dry and I'm going to move back to the Dahlia, which is feeling pretty dry over here. I live in New Mexico and I have found that paint dries quicker here. Watercolor paint dries very quick, which is good and bad. <laughs> Depends on the moment. 
So I'm going to get a strong mixture of Lizarin Crimson. And I'm mixing it with something else that I don't even know what that is. It's probably a little bit of like a purple color. But it's making it nice and dark. Okay. So what I'm going to do is just kind of look at these little petals critically. And then I kind of just decide what spots look like they would be in shadow. And it helps to have a reference. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, this is more about the impression. Even if you just drew a bunch of little dots and drew a bunch of little triangles, it's still going to look good. But just make sure you don't have too much water in your brush. Because if you have too much water, you're going to have a lot less control. And also, if you're using a larger brush, you'll have less control. So using a smaller brush, I switched to the size one. Um, so having a smaller brush and then making sure that this mixture is not too watery. And I didn't grab too much paint. Uh, that really helps with having some control. And obviously, you also want to make sure that this is totally dry. Or else that paint or the water is just going to uh, bleed everywhere and get pulled in every direction. And just going to keep on moving. Go to the other little petals I see. This is very, very, uh, this is a very tight space here. So I'm not really able to really create a lot of detail here um, without really straining my eyes. So as I said, this is just about impression. This is about the impression of little stamen or little tiny petals. But it helps me to work really slowly and just look at it critically. My paint is already drying, so I'm just dropping some extra paint into a few little spots to add some uh, darker color values, add a little bit of contrast. So all you can probably see on the stream is that it just looks like a bunch of little lines, <laughs> but that's, that's good. That's probably what I want for right now. So I'm going to switch to, I'm going to grab another brush, let's see here, I will grab a size zero, why not? And I'm going to use, a, I just damped it and cleaned it off a little bit, and then I'm using that just slightly damp edge to smooth out some of these lines. And I like to do that because it keeps all of my uh, gradients really smooth. Keeps all that color from looking like it's these hard water lines. <laughs> my husband sister. She teases me because every single time I take a drink of anything, even if it's water, I'll take a drink and then just go, ah. <laughs> And then she noticed Dan does that too, my husband. It's like our, <laughs> it's our funny little thing we do. We enjoy a good drink, I guess. <laughs> okay, so I'm doing that technique. As you can see, I'm just dropping a little bit of color along those lines, basically on the outer lines of um, what I drew earlier. So basically anywhere where I feel like there would be a natural kind of little shadow, I just drop some paint and then I use a damp brush to smooth it out. And you definitely want to make sure that there's not too much water or else you won't be able to have much control when you do that technique. One moment, I just rotated my dahlia. There we go. Um, Sandra, you said, how do you usually choose your color? The colors are so beautiful and unique. Um, I have a mixed logic feeling when I see a mixture sign. Um, yes, so I thank you, first of all. I think that... Um, mixing my color. I do a lot of like mixing with what's already on the palette and I also t 
tend to mix a lot of warm tones together. So if I'm mixing a green, it's not uncommon that I might mix some yellow ochre, which is kind of like that warm yellow. And that would give it just a more desaturated kind of feel, which I actually find to be very cozy, very warm. I love that word, nostalgic. I love that. Um, but it's just a lot of experimenting. But yeah, I think my go-to is always the more desaturated pigments. I don't very often just use, so if I'm, you know, I'm painting these, I'm not just painting it pure alizarin crimson, these petals. You know, there's some yellow in there. I'm mixing, like I said, there's some kind of warmer purple colors under here. I'm probably going to mix some other warmer colors as we go. We'll, we'll have to see. But yeah, just a lot of, a lot of color mixing. This part is very, very monotonous. Um, I, like I said, I just do that process of dropping the color with one brush and then using the other one to smooth out um, that color and make it kind of feathered out, a really soft, natural gradient. But monotonous to me does not mean boring. It's so like therapeutic and calming to me to just kind of do these same techniques over and over. I mean, it can get a little bit boring, I guess. If you do it for many hours, but I like it. I always feel like painting reminds me a little bit of like archeology, span not that I've ever done archeology, span <laughs> but it feels like you're using your tools to kind of excavate something. And that's kind of what it feels like to me, like I'm digging something out of the paper with these tools, but instead of actually digging, I'm actually creating, but I don't know, that's the process I kind of think of. And I actually find that my colors here, feeling a tiny bit on the more red side, not as pink. So I'm going to just add a little bit more alizarin crimson. So I'm really, <laughs> really proud. I went downstairs just before this started, and I found my husband. Um, he was drawing a Dahlia, <laughs> and I love that. He's like joining us. He, uh, my husband, creates Southwest style jewelry, as you can see there. Um, but he he does have to draw a lot for what he does because he has to create designs. So. Once I started this challenge, he was like, ooh, I, I should do that. That'd be good for me, good for my drawing skills. So, I'm really proud of him. And his Dahlia looked great. I don't think he's gonna share it on social media, but he just wanted to participate just to, just for the challenge of it. Yeah, that and crimson mix is feeling really nice, really fresh. Not too much of a warm red color like I kind of have in the center there. But I actually like that there'll be some contrasting colors, just a little bit. Like, they'll not contrasting, but there'll be some colors that are not all exactly the same. And that's what you see in life, you know, whenever you look at uh, flowers in the real world. Like, you're going to see all kinds of colors, so embrace it. If your color starts to change while you're working on something, like, just let it happen. I think you'll probably be happy with the end result. Also, if anybody is painting along with me, like, you're even your own, 
um, you'll have to share that with me on Instagram or wherever you post your uh, your Dahlia today. Just let me know you hung out with me, because that would make me happy. <laughs> Kind of cool to know I'm not just painting alone right now. So that one's a little bit dark, but that's okay. I'm not going to worry about it. So after I do all of these petals, what I'll end up doing is going back and doing probably one more layer because I want to add some really dark pink tones in a few spots. I'm telling you guys, it's all about the layers with watercolor. I don't often use a size zero brush. It's probably the first time I've used this one in weeks. I like it, but it just doesn't hold as much water. So it's really just for kind of some finer detail, not necessarily for dropping a lot of color. Using the right brush is so important. Got to make sure if you're covering a lot of ground, you want to use a brush that holds a lot of paint and water, so you can move a little more quickly. I always like to have a spectrum of, of brush sizes. I don't usually use anything smaller than a zero, um, but I feel like in general I probably use like a two and a six or a two and a four, and I can do most paintings with those two sizes. Um, but my canvases are us usually pretty small, I don't use like, you know, I, <laughs> I use paper, so I don't use like, you know, four by five canvases. If I did, I would probably have to use some huge brushes, but yeah, most of mine are like nine by 12, maybe 11 by 15 or 14, but it just depends. It's a while to make your painting what you want it to be. It takes a very long time. I think this one will probably take me... How long have I been doing this already? 38 minutes. Yeah, probably another, I'm probably about halfway done. Maybe not quite. Hard to say. It's always hard to know, too, when, when I'm done. <laughs> and maybe some of you guys can relate. A lot of people talk to me about that, like, how do you know when your painting is done? And um, it's hard to answer that. I kind of just, the more I paint, the more, the more I trust my gut. My gut will tell me, okay, you're overdoing it now. Sometimes it helps also to just kind of step away. And, like, if you're not sure if you're done, try just stepping away for a couple of hours or a day, and then come back to it and look at it, and you'll know. But I think a lot of times when you're just staring at one painting for so long, it's so hard to know. <laughs> Especially with watercolor, because you're just, you're so darn close to it. I mean, I'm right now, my, my face is like a, less than a foot away from this. You know, with oil paints or acrylic paints, um, you know, a lot of those painters use an, an easel and they have those long brushes so they can just easily step back, step back, get some perspective. With watercolor, you do have to be very intentional to step back, so to speak.
this is my first time experimenting with, I think it's one of my first times experimenting with mixed media paper. I'm so used to using watercolor, but um, I, uh, yeah, watercolor, watercolor paper is, is really great, especially if you're doing a lot of washes. Um, I feel like this, to me, feels a bit more like hot press watercolor paper because the texture, the surface, is super, super smooth, um, which I really, really like, actually. Yesterday I scanned my poppy painting I did, just in my scanner right here, and the, the scan was so smooth looking, like I was like, oh dang, I barely have to edit that at all. Some of you might know that whenever you scan watercolor paper, the, um, the paper has a lot of texture. And a lot of times I have to edit that paper out of the background. And sometimes it's kind of a nightmare. <laughs> so it's nice to work with smooth paper. like working in sketchbooks because I feel like um, it kind of feels like it takes the pressure off for me because I'm not going to try and sell them. <laughs> I'm not going to even think along those lines because it's just for me, you know, this is like a beautiful, beautiful sketchbook I have here. I mentioned at the beginning, but in case you missed it, it's from Dustling and Heart. I mean, you can find her on Instagram. But, um, yeah, it's just, I feel like this is like going to be an heirloom. Um, it's just such a beautiful handmade journal. So there's no way that I would ever tear these pages out. And I think that's really neat. I like the idea and having a kind of documented journey like we're doing right now with our art tilber flowers. Having it all documented in one place is really, really special to me. And I love it. Also, I want to share like this. I want to share this really cool thing that happened yesterday. My so there is so my great grandma. I'm like, how, where should I start? Uh, my great grandma, Dorothy. She uh, she passed away maybe 2010 at 99 years old. Uh, she was my dad's grandma. She lived with us for a little while um, when. I was a kid. She was from New York. She went to Pratt uh, Design or Art School in New York, and um, which I, fun fact, I think is where Pam goes in the office. But <laughs> anyways, my Nana, uh, she was a painter, watercolor painter. She was a jeweler. She was, played piano. She was definitely a Renaissance woman. Um, and I remember when I was about 16 years old, I there was a painting we had from her in our home. She did a lot of botanical floral uh, paintings. She did a lot of still life kind of style, but oh my goodness, her paintings were so cool. She had a really, really cool style. But there was a painting she had done of these um, flowers that were in vases she had made. So she had made the vases and she put flowers in them and then she painted that composition. And I loved that painting so much. I remember I would admire it so much. And then I remember, so at around 16, I remember one time I set that painting in front of me and I was like, I'm going to try to paint this with watercolor. And at that point I had only like a Crayola set <laughs> of, um, of paints. And I had never really tried watercolors at that point. And Actually, no, sorry, I wasn't 16, I was 18, because of that house we were living in. So I was 18 years old, it was one of my first times really experimenting with watercolors. And I remember I tried to copy her painting, and I did such a bad job. And it looked nothing like hers. And I remember feeling like that was one of those moments that I had where I was just like, well, guess I don't have the gene, which is so dumb. 
to think after one attempt that you just don't have <laughs> you don't have it in you. Because anything worth doing takes practice and time. So, a little soapbox moment there. But yeah, I just remember feeling kind of bummed. But I loved that painting so much. And I remember I wanted, my, my sister and I moved to Nashville when I was 22. So in 2013? Yeah, in 2013. And I remember I asked my mom if I could take that painting. And I remember we kind of were like, mm, she, I kinda, we kind of went back and forth. She really wanted to keep it for their house. Um, so she was like, okay, one day you can have it. So fast forward, like maybe seven years, maybe like two years ago, I started asking my mom where that painting was. And I, I searched everywhere. Like I searched their attic. I searched, I asked all my aunts and uncles if they had it. I asked my, my grandma, who was her daughter, I asked her if she had it. Nobody could find it. And I was so bummed because I never took a picture of it or anything. It just only existed in my memory. And so I kind of accepted it. It was about two years ago. Um, so yesterday I got a text from my sister and she texted me a photo of it. And I freaked out because like I said, I hadn't seen it in like many years. <laughs> and I was so excited. Um, uh, I guess she said that it was up in my parents' attic. attic. I, I guess I didn't do a good enough job searching and their attic is really gross, so it's not hard to believe that I would have given up pretty quickly. <laughs> but um, I was so happy to see that painting, and it just felt so sweet to see it after all these years, and I looked at it, and I was like, yeah, I could paint that now. I know I could paint that. I don't know if I will, but I don't know. That was just really special. So special, and I'm so glad to know that that painting still exists. And I will probably... If I ever get to have it, I'm sure my mom will give it to me. <laughs> but if I ever get to have it, I will definitely cherish that forever. So there's my story about Nana painting. I'll have to share a photo of it. Um, maybe I'll share it on my Instagram stories today. Okay, wow, this like took me way longer than I expected. <laughs> Hard to know. Lots of little details, huh? Okay, so now I'm going to, I'm gonna go back, starting in the center. Pull up my reference, I kinda lost it there for a minute. One second. Okay. So I'm going to just drop some darker color in a few spots where I feel like it needs it. Just that same color, but just a darker mixture of it. And that's how we get darker values in watercolors. You just use a little bit less water and a little more paint. And that's how you get those dark colors. give the impression that some of those petals are are, are fold, folded in on themselves, kind of like a little hot dog bun. <laughs> it's the only metaphor I could think of. But, um, yeah, I'm just going to drop this color in there and I'll work my way out. And like I said, it's about the impression of detail. It doesn't have to be actually 100% detailed. Having those really strong contrasts of light and dark in the center there is going to give it a lot of interest really quick. Um, so now I'm going to... I'm also going to be, as I, go in, as I um, kind of work my way out, I'm gonna draw some lines kind of reaching out in those petals. Just kind of like some really light little veins that are reaching out towards the tips of those petals. I 
I just saw that Terry is in here. Hello, Terry. Good to hear from you this morning. See how that, those dark contrasts just immediately give it so much more interest and life. A painting is not done to me until I add those dark, dark details. Okay. Just keep on moving. This part's a little quicker than what I just did. And again, if you want to use the same reference as me, I attached the link in the description. And it's a um, a free photo to use from Upsplash. Um, I guess those are copyright free images that you can use. I always try to encourage my fellow painters. And this is definitely a tricky territory and it's a tricky subject. But I, I try not to use just random photos from Google or Pinterest as my reference photos. I am not perfect about it, so I'm not going to get up here on a soapbox and tell you never do that, because I've definitely done it in the past, and I will do it from time to time. But when I do do that, I try and make sure that it's very different from the original. So I'll either like completely change the color, I won't use that entire uh, photograph as my reference, but rather I'll use a part of it. So for example, I am working on a painting right now that has like seven different flowers in it and a bunch of greenery. So I did grab some photos off of Pinterest that I really loved, but I made sure that I was taking one flower from a composition and then taking one flower from a different photo and then always changing the color. And I know it sounds like a lot. I know it sounds kind of like a lot of steps to take, like why not just copy? And you can, but I would just recommend asking the photographer for permission if you can. So if you're painting flowers and you found an incredible bouquet, just send the, send the, uh, the florist or photographer an email and ask them for their permission. I, I did one last year or two years ago that was straight up from a photograph and I had emailed the photographer who was also the florist I asked her if I could use it as a reference, and she was like, yes, please, go ahead, thank you so much for asking. So, photographers are artists, too. I mean, I it hurts me whenever people just copy my paintings that are not tutorials, or if it's just like one of my random paintings that I have available for sale as a print. I've seen a lot of people copy my paintings and then uh, sell, copy them and then sell them as their own work. And sometimes that's not cool. <laughs> sometimes that kind of hurts, to be honest. It makes me feel a little discouraged. And I think it's also a discredit to um, the, the person copying me because I feel like we're all capable of creating like such incredible, unique, original work. And it's a discredit to yourself to um, copy another, especially another painter. Um, but that's definitely a, a soapbox there, but we, we can talk about that another time. But I just always try and encourage people to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Just try and have that rule. Like if it would hurt you to be copied, it would probably hurt other people to be copied. And yeah, just always try and be considerate. And I love that websites like Upsplash exist because you can just use those photos all day long and create amazing compositions for your own paintings. Also, another thing I recommend, and this one's so fun, but go to Trader Joe's or Whole Foods or Kroger, wherever grocery store you have, and buy some fresh flowers and take photos of them yourself and then just have a folder in your phone of uh, fresh flower inspiration. <laughs> that's from your own mind, kind of, because you took those photos. And to be honest, that's just an excuse to buy yourself flowers. I told my husband that I now consider buying flowers a business write-off. 
because I, I need them. I need them for my work. I don't need them. I guess I could use websites like Upsplash, but I really like to compose my own um, photos of florals I'm using. It's super fun. So there you go. I wasn't planning on talking about that today, but you never know. definitely have uh, some really tricky situations um, regarding intellectual property theft. And I'm not, not, not even just what I was just talking about, but I've had a couple of companies um, take designs that I have and then license them without any permission from me and obviously definitely not paying me. Um, one of the biggest one that happened was I believe it was all this year, it was a company called Xi'an, which is a, I guess it's like a Chinese um, clothing or manufacturing company. I thought it was just clothing, but there's a branch of their site, and they're a huge company. Like, they've got millions and millions of followers, and I think they make a lot of sales, too, because their prices are so cheap. I've seen them all over Pinterest and all over YouTube, but yeah, anyways, they, they, used a couple, no, not a couple, it was like probably eight different designs, um, but I was able to communicate with them and they were able to take those images down and they actually ended up paying me um, for having them up on their site without permission because they had made a lot of sales. But they, uh, I guess they had gotten them from a, a company that they license with or something? I don't know. I've also found my designs up on Alibaba, which is another website that's kind of notorious for that. It's a big problem, and I honestly don't know what to do about it. it everybody's always like, get a lawyer! <laughs> but I don't want to. I don't want to spend my, my energy chasing that stuff down because it makes me really discouraged and I don't feel like I don't know I feel like whenever I do that whenever I really start to chase down um, people who've copied me or companies that have stolen stuff from me it makes me less inspired to create and I hate that like I feel like that's the, that's what I was put on this earth to do is to create and I feel like if I were to chase down that kind of stuff it really robs my creative energy and joy and I don't want that so it's tricky because I also think it matters to you know fight that kind of naughtiness <laughs> but I don't know I don't know guys it's just a lot if you if you know the answer if you have advice you, you tell me <laughs> I'll just be over here but, uh, yeah, I think that it is sad, though, because, like I said, it makes me less inspired to to create, and I hate that because it's what I love to do more than anything, so. As you can see, these definitely took me a while. It's probably been about an hour now. Yep. Haven't even touched the leaves yet. I guess this is kind of one of my last um, details here. I love to draw those little uh, those little veins reaching out. Makes it feel like a true dahlia.
Let's see, I feel like my center feels a bit more yellow than I want. So what I'm going to do is just drop a little bit of alizarin crimson over some of these little, little more yellow spots. So it just feels a little more, um, a little more natural. Kind of makes it all feel really tied together. Even that little bit that felt that felt like that elevated that in my mind. Okay, so I'm just going to do, I think this will be the last detail I do on my dolly. I just grabbed a ton of alizarin crimson in this brush. And I'm just gonna drop that rich, rich, rich dark color into the spots where I feel like it would be the darkest. And that just gives us so much dimension so quickly when you drop that kind of dark color, it starts to pop off the page. I might come back and do that in a little while because I did just drop a little bit of wet paint in the center, so I'm not able to paint in the very center because as I mentioned, if this area is wet, you're not going to be able to add detail over it until it's totally dry. Because that water likes to keep things even. <laughs> it likes to keep things fair and equally dispersed. Um, so you got to work with it whenever it's totally dry if you want to drop dark color. Oh, thank you. Journal. I feel like you guys are the first people who've ever mentioned that I should do a Patreon. I won't say I haven't thought about it, but I don't know. If I were to do it, um, I would probably just do some tutorials, like exclusive tutorials. Um, but, well, no buts, I don't know what to say after that, but, <laughs> but thank you guys, that actually means a lot to me. Uh, if, if you guys didn't know, I actually do have a couple of classes available on my site, um, but they, uh, two of them cost money, one of them is free, and then I do have a bunch of tutorials on YouTube. I probably have like five or six tutorials now. And then I also have some Michael's classes that I've taught. Actually, yesterday on Instagram, I, I made a folder, or I like a story folder of all of the Michael's classes. Because people were always asking me for links, and I was like, shoot, I need to have them in like just a spot where people can find them easily. So those are all there. They're all about an hour. They're kind of like this, honestly. The format is kind of similar, but way more organized. <laughs> this painting, I didn't plan it out. I just went for it. But um, my Michael's classes are super um, planned out, and they're also, uh, I think they're a little more approachable. This is, at least this one here I'm working on is, I would say it's a little bit more complex. Um, I could not have done this one for a Michael's class because I would be, I would be going way over. <laughs> but the thing about the Michael's classes is as I am painting, I don't know if you guys have ever taken one of those classes, but as I'm painting, um, there'll be a moderator who's asking me questions from the chat because I have a hard time, you know, looking up to the chat while I'm painting. So, so they'll ask me questions and I have to kind of think about it while I'm painting and talking while I'm painting. It does slow me down a little, but... I'm not used to talking while I paint, necessarily. I think I work quicker when I'm not talking. But it's so fun to talk. I really do love answering those questions, though. It's really fun. People stump me all the time, too. Well, not necessarily stump me, but there's been a couple times where people have asked questions. I'm like, oh, I've never thought about that. So it is really, it's really good for me to be asked questions like during a class because it helps me think a little bit more critically 
and think about things like from a different perspective and you know I only can see things the way I see things and from my own perspective so it's good for me one thing people always always ask me about in those classes is using watercolor pencils and I don't use watercolor pencils but um, Wednesday and Newton is they're actually sending me a box of them I think in the next few days to try out so I'm definitely going to be experimenting with those and see what kind of stuff I can come up with I didn't realize they were such a big thing that so many other artists use them I actually get a lot of people asking me if my paintings are colored pencils because I have a more detailed style a lot of people think that it is colored pencils and I believe that a lot of like botanical artwork especially the really detailed botanical artwork it is colored pencil artwork a lot of the times a lot of the time but we'll see it's hard to imagine liking it more than using like you know this setup because you know once you get used to something it's hard to mix it up <laughs> thanks Hannah I think you'll like watercolor pencils yeah maybe I maybe I will I'll probably use them in junction with brushes which I think is maybe how you do it I don't even know but I'm excited to try it out I love Windsor and Newton though they're pretty frequently they're like hey do you want to try this out do you want to try this out I'm like okay <laughs> it's not what I would necessarily it's not my instinct but I think it's good for me to to try things other than just watercolor um, a lot of people are just like why do you just do flowers like why do you just do watercolor <laughs> like I don't know I just like it it's I'm not gonna do something I like less I don't know but there's only one way to know if you like it and obviously that's trying it out um, one thing I tried this year it's actually here on my YouTube channel uh, you can watch it if you want to, obviously, but it's uh, it was me experimenting with water-soluble oil paints, which I don't understand how that works, because oil and water should never work together, but they're, like, genetically engineered or something. But anyways, I experimented with water-soluble oils, and I made a video about it, but those were really hard, and I thought I would like it a lot more. Um... And it might be a similar situation to what I mentioned about like trying to do something like with those paints that are trying to do something with those Crayola paints, trying to create that painting my grandma made. It might be a similar situation, just that my first couple attempts, I wasn't very good at it. And so I was not super inspired to keep doing it. Um, so I really should try again with those water soluble oils because I love the way oil paints oil paintings look um, especially I love like the really kind of like Monet style like kind of choppier looking impressionistic palette knife style of painting it's kind of the equivalent to me of like loose watercolors but in oils of course I have no idea how to do that <laughs> I'd have to take a class on that but I should experiment more my grandma um, on my mom's side um, she was an oil painter, and she she used classic oils, not water soluble. But it's such a nostalgic smell to me whenever I smell oil paints, or maybe it's the turpentine, which I probably shouldn't be smelling. <laughs> I think it's like really toxic, but I don't know. Watercolor is just so fun. Okay, I am kind of overworking that Dahlia. My gut just told me. Time to listen. Okay, so I'm going to finish up these leaves. Um, and I'm going to read the chat really quick. Aw, thank you, Angie. Okay, so now let's paint this leaf. I'm curious if anybody's painting along with me, or if you guys are working on your own thing, or if you're 
if you even paint or if you're just uh, here for the enjoyment of art creation. All right, so what I'm going to do for this leaf back here, uh, I'm going to just follow the stem, follow that, or that center vein, I guess, and then draw these little veins that are reaching out. So I'm just dropping the paint pretty liberally here. And then I will use my damp brush to gently uh, smooth out that color. Don't want it to look too uh, unnatural. I want it to feel really soft. This is kind of how I shade. I use a damp brush to kind of smooth that color, feather it out. And that water color, that water just keeps that paint move it, moving and keeps it, keeps it uh, uh, really smooth. The watercolor brush isn't necessarily just for laying down color. You can use it to just kind of smooth shade, lift. You can do so many things with a watercolor brush. So I'm going to paint the back side of this leaf here. I'll paint it all dark just to give the impression that there's a turn in this leaf. And then on the front side, I'll just draw these little veins. And I have only had coffee today, so my hand's a little bit shaky. But I'm just going to embrace it. Drawing the veins is where I really can see if my hand is shaky. Because <laughs> that's where it really matters. Okay, so then use my damp brush. And then gently smooth that color. I actually really enjoy doing this. Um, it, it, so like the, the Michaels classes I teach are live um, as well as this one, but this definitely feels a little bit more, a little bit less stressful, I guess. Um, not that the Michael situation is super stressful, but I don't know. There's just a lot of people in there who I don't know, and I feel like you guys are like my people who I know, so. <laughs> so it's just nice. It feels very comfortable. And also there's like significantly less people here. <laughs> so I don't feel as intimidating. Some of my, uh, some of my Michael's classes, I think the largest one was uh, maybe 700 or 750 or something. I don't know if they all stuck around, but a big crowd and uh, I hate public speaking <laughs> I guess it's not public speaking if you're just technically like in your studio painting but it kind of is so okay I feel like these leaves as I'm looking at them, I'm just kind of critiquing as I go. I think they're a little bit flat and one dimensional, and I think that they could use a little bit of color outside of what I'm doing. So I'm going to drop a little bit of, hmm, I'll do a little bit of yellow ochre, which is right up here. It's probably yellow ochre mixed with a real and yellow mixed with a little bit of burnt sienna, but that's okay. So I will drop just a little bit of that color in a few spots on, the, on these leaves, and then I'll smooth it all together. And I think just having that mixture of yellow and kind of like the cooler tones, it just keeps it interesting to me. Uh, one thing I do really frequently when I'm painting is I squint at my painting, and I feel like that's a way for me to quote-unquote step back um, as I was mentioning earlier like obviously like oil painters or people working in larger canvases can step back more easily and get like a full perspective full picture view and I think for me if I squint at it I'm able to see okay that feels too light that feels too dark that feels awkward whatever um, that feels like it's just 
a boring color, like I need to add a little bit of variety. So yeah, the squint trick. I don't really know why that works, but I guess it just kind of, it shows you blocks rather than the, you don't, you don't get caught in the weeds looking at little details. Um, so yeah, it's a great way to just quote unquote step back. Um, and I'm reading your comments really quick. Thank you. Aw, thank you. More encouragement to do Patreon or Skillshare. Um, yeah. I have some friends on Skillshare. I love Skillshare, personally, just because I use it. Well, I use the free trial. <laughs> I don't have it anymore, I don't think. But, um... I should because there's so many good classes on there. Like I've learned about using Photoshop better. I've learned about just like some marketing stuff. They have such interesting classes over there. Um, but I haven't really done my research as far as like um, why Skillshare would be a better option as opposed to having classes available to purchase on their website. Um, I know you can definitely reach a larger audience through Skillshare. I think that my personality, my bent, is to um, limit the number of places I exist on. Um, and obviously right now I'm on like Instagram, I'm on YouTube, and then I have my newsletter, my email newsletter, which if you're not on, you should join. But um, I don't know, I just like to be in like fewer places and so I like having the idea of my, I like the idea of my, um, my Instagram and my YouTube kind of maybe leading people to be on my newsletter and then maybe buy classes from my website, which, you know, full disclosure here, but when I sell classes on my website, I don't split that, you know, I'm able to just keep that profit, which is really nice because all those other websites like Patreon and Skillshare, like they take a huge cut. They have big platforms, which is great because, you know, you'd be able to, like, really reach a lot of people. But I know somebody who uh, I think that she's making almost a 1000 on Patreon. And, no, sorry, not a 1000 She's making, like, 10000 She's making a lot. But Patreon takes about a 1000 of that a month, which is kind of a lot. I mean, 10000 is a lot, a lot, but <laughs> I don't know. Pros and cons, right? I need to make a pros and cons list. That's how I decide everything. <laughs> but I am a huge proponent of, of doing the things that I feel a natural draw to or a natural curiosity to. Or to. Um, I guess draw is probably a better word, but I, I love Instagram. I love YouTube. These are both places that I spend a good amount of time on. Um, 